Okay, welcome everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming for today's lecture, where we will be speaking again about the uh, second part about language. Um, two organizational announcements. Um, can you be quiet, please? The first one is um, for everybody. Next week the lecture uh, is cancelled, so we won't have the lecture next week. And uh, we see us in two weeks time then. The material covered in that lecture, which would have been covered in that lecture, is still part of the exam. So you still have to prepare from the textbook. And you can just look at the video recording of the 2015 lecture. So on BBL there is a link to YouTube and in the next couple of days I will also include a direct uh, video on BBL. If you encounter problems with watching the video or something, then let me know that we can try to figure that out. Um, but that way you will have like a virtual lecture then next week and uh, you can do that anytime you want to. Second announcement is for the master students. Um, I've sent around an email, please uh, look at BBL, there's an assignment set up for the oral presentations and please make sure you all upload your slides from the presentation um, until next Tuesday, which is the deadline for that, which we require to do just the grading and everything. Okay, so um, as a very first thing, as far as I know you already uh, learned about the McGurk effect in Marikes module last year. Who does not remember what the McGurk effect is? Everybody does remember and knows that. No. And their heads shaking. Okay, so um, as kind of a refresher, I skipped it last week, but I realized this week we will be uh, referring to that a couple of times. Just have a very quick look at a video illustrating the McGurk effect. I'm sure when you see it you will remember and, and know that. Uh, just follow the instruction from the video. Many of us have become quick to catch illusions that trick our eyes, but how often do you consider <coughs> illusions of the ear? Are you really able to trust your ears and the things they hear? For example, listen to Greg speaking. Bar. Far, 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 far. What do you hear? If you heard far, 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 you'd be right. But how about now? Far, 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 far. Chances are you heard far, far, far this time with an F. Except you didn't. In fact, the audio didn't even change between the two videos. Far, far. Far. Strange as it may seem, what you hear depends on which video you're looking at. Go ahead, take turns watching each video and see how the sound morphs. Far. Far. This is a perfect example of something called the McGurk effect, which shows how our visuals can alter what we believe we're hearing. Now I want you to count how many times you see a circle flash on screen. Let's do that one more time. Did you see it flash twice? Many people do, yet without the sound, it becomes clear that the circle is only flashing once. Okay, it all was just about the McGurk effect. We can skip the other parts. And the key thing about the McGurk effect, which we will need for today's session, is that it illustrates that basically our vision of how a sound is produced shapes how we do perceive the sound. So somehow this must be integrated and incorporated, so our analysis of speech is not solely dependent on the auditory input, but also on our visual input. We will see the relevance of that in a moment. By the way, the McGurk effect was discovered not far from here in the University of Surrey in Guildford, a researcher there. Uh, discovered that by accident when cutting audio material and then mixing up video with audio slides. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a look at some theories of speech perception. And um, as we have seen last time already and got, got a good idea that speech recognition is really a pretty complex process. If you think about the formants and the spectrograms and these co-articulation and stuff like that. So, on a higher level, we also can see that we have an effect of syntax, how the uh, 
how the uh, sentence is structured on the semantics uh, that a word can have different meanings depending on where it is in the sentence. We have seen these top-down influences in the phonemic restoration effect where we had a cuff overlaying some sound and we reproduce always that sound which just fits into the context of the sentence. And, as just demonstrated, we see by the McGurk effect that speech perception actually is a multi multimodal process where we uh, have to well, where we integrate vision and audition. And today we are going to discuss three of really many theories, but these are three very important and key theories in the field. The first one is a motor theory, as proposed by Lieberman, then the cohort theory, and finally the trace model, which is a computational model. Okay, let's start with the motor theory of speech perception. And this is really, has been suggested by Alvin Lieberman, and the idea is really, in, in the first instance, a little bit strange. Because the idea is, well, we actually don't perceive speech by dedicated areas for speech perception, brain areas, but what we use are actually our brain areas with, uh, used for speech production. So that a premotor cortex. So the areas which we, which, with which we produce speech, we also understand speech. So the way it is supposed to work is that if we hear a speech signal, what we are actually doing is kind of mimicking the movements which are required to produce that sound which we are hearing. And by production of the movements, we do understand the speech and then we know what the speech sound is about. That is the idea of that. And of course we don't overtly uh, produce these movements. So basically the motor system is involved in both, in the production of speech and the perception of speech. There's quite a bit of support for that theory actually. So as we have seen the McGurk effect, this nicely fits into this theory because visual information about how the sound is produced from a motor point of view shapes our perception. Then, if you remember last, oh no, sorry, we didn't speak about this last time. Um, there is some uh, phenomenon which is called categorical perception. And if you remember last time, we spoke about phonemes, which are the most basic units of sound which distinguish between meaning. So we spoke, for instance, about R and L. And what you can do is, you can morph one phoneme towards another phoneme. So by making it more and more similar to the other one. Like you know this from these visual programs where you morph one face to look like another face. You can do the same in sound. Now what happens here is an interesting thing. Listeners do not perceive any intermediate stages. They either hear one or the other phoneme. You cannot distinguish anything in between. So it's like our system takes anything from a certain variety and maps it strictly on one thing and once we cross a border then it's strictly onto the other thing. And it all sounds the same for us. Which makes a lot of sense in terms of that on a very low level we even out any variances to make the input more stable and then the later mechanisms for them it's more easier to understand with the word and the phony. So, as in the example, for instance, we will see later a spectrogram of this as well, da and ta. We can morph them from a da towards a ta. And then we either hear da or ta very clearly. And the, this is in support of the motor theory because usually we do produce only da or ta. We actually cannot produce without our motor system, at least after we have learned that either uh, anything in between. The interesting point is that very young children, only a couple of months old, they still would be able to distinguish between these morphemes. Only by learning this language-specific phonemes we get this categorical perception to help our processes. 
Okay, so this is a diagram of that, and here you have the spectrograms to represent that. So each uh, stripe here basically is a formant, so the sound ba, the B in the beginning sounds like this, so you have it certain frequencies and then over time it changes here. And then you have da, and you can see the beginning here is different, so this is down, this is upwards here, so that makes the particular d sound instead of a b sound. And then you have the same here for g, a g sound. And you can see that you can do these smooth continuous transitions here, and this is a transitional phase where when you present the identical stimulus over and over again the same participant would sometimes say I heard ba and sometimes da due to just noise and random fluctuation but they always hear clearly one sound only. Further support comes from the area of cognitive neuroscience for that theory because if you do brain imaging studies, fMRI studies, where you can map the area, brain areas which are active during a task, then listening to speech, just listening, also activates the motor areas, the premotor areas, which are usually used in speech production. So this is one indication. And a further indication, if you use TMS, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation, so you use magnetic pulses to briefly disrupt the functioning of a brain area, it's like a very brief temporary brain lesion. If you do that over the premotor cortex, so a motor area, you actually impair speech perception. So there's really some evidence that uh, there is some merit to this theory. There's a very close link to that, and these are the very fashionable and popular mirror neurons, which in my personal view the concept is slightly stretched uh, and probably does not extend that far. Originally they have been kind of discovered by the group of Rizzolatti in Italy and Vittorio Gallese and, uh, in the early 1990s. And what they found in uh, the monkey that there are certain neurons which fire when which monkey does a certain action. So if he takes food into his mouth, this particular example of a neuron does fire. If he takes the food and puts it into a bowl, the neuron fires much less. Now the interesting property of this, these neurons is if the monkey observes another person eating, it fires, and if it observes the other person just putting in a bowl, like in the own action, it does not fire. So some neurons code both the um, perception of an action and the actual action itself, performing the action. So that would be in line with the motor theory of speech perception. However, please note that the motor theory was already proposed in the late 1960s, while the mirror neurons were not discovered before the early 1990s. So Lieberman was well ahead of time, in a way, in this idea. Okay. So, um, as a little exercise, I presented now quite a good body of evidence why the motor theory is probably or has some merit. However, um, there are some drawbacks. It has problems with some other things. So uh, think about in small groups of two or three people and discuss can you see any limitations of the theory where it might have problems or generally, what are the consequences of that, if that really is the case? Just try to get a little bit deeper for like five minutes or so, and um, if you come across a limitation or you think that's a noteworthy point, please post it to uh, Paul Everywhere. It should be active, if I see that right.
Let's have a look what you wrote. Okay, I think there were quite, quite a few, few good points here. Um, one thing in general about this uh, McGurk effect where uh, we see an influence of the visual information on our speech perception, um, people would not go so far that we would necessarily need the visual input. It's just shown that it does affect 
what we hear. So we can still hear perfectly without visual input, but if we get that, then it can interfere in somehow. And that just shows that it links somehow to the same system. So it's not necessary, the visual input, for that. Um, there was one point uh, which was good, which is uh, on the slides as well, on the next ones, uh, so that infants, they are very good at already understanding speech before they actually can produce speech. So that poses a serious challenge to the model. So how could that work then? Uh, then uh, other things, uh, if you have damage to broker, the speech production area, you can still understand the area. So the question is a little bit whether um, these areas, for instance, just lighten up incidentally with listening or whether they are really necessary for the understanding. And for instance, if you do TMS over these areas, uh, your speech perception may be a little bit less good, but it's not that you would lose all your ability to understand the speech. So there are quite a few, few good, uh, good points. Okay. So a, a further pro um, point is that speech product production is very variable. As we have seen, we have these many different variations. Last time we said the word the can be spoken in at least 50 different ways. So how can we make sure that when we have a certain way to speak words and other people have a certain way that we mimic actually the same phoneme because that would be very difficult and different. Uh, already said, infants are good at speech perception but not at production. So learning speech at least must be based on different mechanisms. And which in theory doesn't rule out that later on the mechanism changes and the motor theory becomes more, um, more appropriate. A further problem is the top-down effects we observe, like the phonemic restoration effects, because primary motor or premotor cortices, they don't encode any meaning. There's no access to meaning there. So that is a little bit challenging as well here in its clear form. Okay, so to summarize, the motor theory has been revised several times in its long life due to these uh, problems and then you have a revised version which tries to counter the problems and then you get new problems. However, um, it's still debated. There's clearly some merit to it, but it's not clear um, where it stands exactly. Okay, do we have any questions on the motor theory? Okay, then let's go to the next theory. Um, motor theory sounds or is a little bit cognitive neuroscience with a strong link to the neuroanatomy. Cohort theory now is really now pretty much down to cognitive psychology. So slightly different approach here to explain that or different way. And um, it was proposed by William Morrison Wilson in the 1980s and it basically explains how the words are mapped onto our lexicon which we have. So everybody who's able to speak a language has a lexicon of all the words. So the question is when we receive the input how do we decide which word that was? And what has been uh, found is that we try this process of identifying the word already uh, when we hear the first phoneme and not only after the word, the spoken word, has finished. And um, one uh, key evidence for this uh, statement comes from shadowing tasks. So where participants have these headphones and they have to speak out loud what they hear. And uh, they start speaking out the words already before the actual word has finished. Okay, now how does it word selection happen according to the cohort theory? And there are quite a few uh, quite smart experiments to show that this seems to be exactly the case or that this uh, is something which happens. So suppose you started hearing a sentence which started with I took the car for a and then the new next input is s. So what the cohort theory says is you activate 
all words in your lexicon which start with an S, with that phoneme. So soap, spinach, psychologist, spin, sun, spank. And this is the so-called initial cohort. So that's where we start out with. It's potentially huge. Now we get the next input, let's say P, and then all words which do not fit with that, so all words which do not start with sp, are removed like sun uh, or soap. So we, only that is left. And then we get the I, so only these are left over. And then we get an N, and then we have a point of recognition where we say, okay, the word is spin. I took the car for a spin. And this is the recognition point where we only have one word left and the input typically continues and that word is then integrated into the semantic or the syntactic context of the sentence. Okay. And what has been shown is that in this stepwise process, the processing differs a little bit depending on the stage. So very early, when we start out from the initial cohort and start to reduce the cohort, then the processing is mainly bottom up. So if you do manipulations on the phoneme or acoustic level, then you get effects here. However, later in the process, where we are very close to the rec recognition point or afterwards, we also have top-down influences, where then the recognition is influenced, for instance, by the context. Okay, any questions to the cohort, for the cohort model? Okay, then we go to the trace model, um, which is in certain ways quite related to the cohort model, um, but it's a computational model, and we will go through that in a bit more detail, because it's not only interesting in the sense of how is speech perception organized in our mind, but also, again, to illustrate how do such connectionist or computational models actually work to explain the human mind and cognition. Okay, it was proposed by James McClelland and Elman in the 1980s, and as I said, it's a computer model. And for instance, if you look at simulation results, you see that the activation of different words, so this is time or cycles, and this is the activation strength, behaves pretty much like predicted of the cohort model. And that is, if the final word is bald, then in the beginning, bill is activated, but that loses its activation first because the second phoneme already is I and doesn't fit. Then bad is the second one and the third then is ball and because it's closest to bald and then only bald is the winner and is selected. Okay, so how does this model look like? It is um, conceived to have several levels or layers and it starts out with auditory features, then it goes to the phonemes, detection of phonemes, and then to the identification of words. And these different layers, they're connected with each other in a way of activation. So the phonemes can activate words. And if a word has some activity, it activates its phonemes as well, so it feeds back some activity. So, and these are kind of top-down influences, which can nicely be simulated in the model, as you will see in a moment. However, within a layer, um, the connections are inhibitory. This is called lateral inhibition. So, if I'm activated, I inhibit all my neighbors. And if a neighbor is activated, it will inhibit me. <clears throat> okay, let's go through the different steps and layers here. And let's start on the most basic level, the auditory features. And it basically, the model, the input into the model are simplified spectrograms, as we have learned them already. So it's B, A, A G for bag. So we have these energy profiles, which then describe the place and manner of articulation. And so these auditory features then feed into the detection of the phonemes. 
which is the next higher level. And the idea uh, or the way the model is set up is the following. And that is when you think of a word like cat, we have three letters in the word. And the model predicts that for each letter, for each kind of serial position, we have a full set of all possible phonemes. So the first letter could be A, B, C, D and so forth. The second letter could be A, B, C, D and so forth. So that it looks like that. For the first letter we have a complete set of phonemes. For a second letter we have that. And for the word cat, the C would be activated in the first set. and the second set, the A would be activated. and the third, the T would be activated. And because of this lateral inhibition, what we spoke about, if the C is active, it would inhibit all neighboring, all other phonemes here. The same way the A inhibits here. So it is a winner-takes-all principle. And for each serial position of phonemes, only one phoneme is identified and passed forward to the word level to identify the words. Okay, yes. Are ventriloquists effectively tricking us by putting in incorrect phonemes which are perhaps, well, we're putting in top down processing to hear what we think we hear? How can they put in incorrect phonemes? It's because they're, they're speaking without moving their mouth so that their puppet seems to be speaking, but they're, they're, they will substitute phonemes so that they don't have lip movement. Well, I guess they found a way to produce sounds which are very... I'm not an expert on that, <laughs> so uh, never tried it myself, um, that they somehow are able to produce speech without moving their lips. So, um, according to categorical perception, what you have to do is produce a sound which is close enough to the original phoneme to be identified as that. So I don't think they deliberately produce wrong ones, they just to try to produce phonemes which are as close as possible to the correct pronunciation but without moving their lips. So um, I don't know, they're possibly, I mean I don't know how you do that for these sounds which require this close of sounds of p and b. Um, or whether the movement is just so minute and because we look at the puppet, you know, like in the attention lectures, that there actually is some movement, but we didn't, don't realize that. Or, um, but again, I'm, I'm not an expert. But I'm sure I always search the, on YouTube for these demonstrations, illustrations. It is really fascinating what's all on there. So if you type into YouTube, tricks of ventriloquism, I'm sure you will find a perfect uh, illustration, demonstration. Okay, so the word level reflects basically the lexicon. And in trace, this lexicon is limited only to one syllable word, so to only very short words. And on the word level, we again have this lateral inhibition, so that finally only one word is selected and put forward to higher levels, which are not modeled in trace, which then would parse the syntax. And the words are activated by the phonemes in a bottom-up way. However, as I said before, the words also activate their phonemes. Okay, so let's have a word and uh, look at an example how such a system would identify the word cat. And such models work in cycles through that. And let's say, okay, then calculate all activation values, then go to the next cycle, new input, and so forth. So let's go through the cycles. Let's say the first auditory feature is um, this phoneme of a k sound. Then we have on our phoneme level uh, the activation of the C. Now what happens now is that on the word level all words which start with that phoneme are activated. Cat, can, cop. Now these words now when they are activated they feed back some activation. So when cat is activated it activates the C here, the A here and the T here. If can is activated, it activates also the C, then the A, and then the N. And if cop is activated, 
it does accordingly these things. One way in behavioral experiments to find out whether this is really the case or not is by priming experiments where you then can see when you just present the C do you already prime these type of words and are they detected quicker than words which have no pre-activation here. Okay, then the A is presented. So we know the second position is an A so it can't be COP. So this activation falls away and the top-down activation falls away as well, which feeds back to the phonemes. Then the T comes and the same thing happens. We know now that the th third letter is a phoneme is a T, so the activation to CAN falls away and the top-down activation goes away as well. And finally, um, we know the word is CAT and have identified it. Now the strength of this model are it's a computer model and that has a lot of advantages. We can specify it really well. We can set parameters, we can say okay if something is activated by what amount is it activated, how long does it take and all these type of things. It also explains nicely how bottom-up and top-down processes interact because we have this top-down feedback from the word level to the phoneme level. And it can explain a number of empirical findings again, like the other theories. So for instance, categorical speech perception. Again, if you remember morphing a D towards a T using a speech synthesizer, then um, we only hear a D or a T. And in this model, it's explained by this lateral inhibition the winner takes all principle on the phoneme level because only one of the two can win and will be forwarded to the word level. So according to Trace there can't be anything intermediate between the two. Okay. Um, another finding and I apologize for a slightly poor structuring of my slides because um, a nice a nicer illustration in form of visual graphics of this word superiority effect comes only in a couple of slides. So the word superiority effect has a lot of different aspects or facets to it and in the current context um, suppose the task is um, to detect a specific target phoneme and as a c one condition the phoneme occurs in uh, a series of phonemes, so it's auditory input, which is part of a real word. Or in the other condition, it's part of a non-word. So also something which makes sense to say, um, I don't know, can anybody tell me a non-word? Uh, I don't know, gnofta or something like that, you know, something weird. Uh, then you have this th sound. Or you may say buffer and you have this F sound. When your target is to detect whether there's an F in the word or not, if it appears in a proper word, you're faster than when it's in a non-word. And for the task, it doesn't matter whether it's a word or non-word. You just have to listen for this phoneme. And it can, ex um, it can be explained by trace because you have to this top-down feedback from the word level. So when the word is already partially pre-activates the F phoneme, you're faster in detecting that. If you have a non-word, you have no activity on the word level which could feed back and pre-activate. Okay, so there are of course weaknesses as well. Um, it's limited to one syllable words and one might be inclined to say well it's just a little bit more programming effort to extend it but uh, there are theoretical reasons why it is unclear whether it would be actually really generalized to larger lexicons and longer words. Uh, so it might hit some limitations here. Uh, no learning is implemented so far this potentially could be done uh, but in the current version it's basically set up by the experimenter how the connections are what the words are and everything and these top-down effects are sometimes overemphasized in reality they are not as strong as predicted by the model 
Okay, so to summarize the three theories which we've spoken about today. So the first one is the motor theory of speech perception, where we've seen well, where the idea is that we perceive speech by covertly mimicking the motor responses, by activating our motor systems. Then the cohort theory, where the final word is gradually selected by reducing this cohort, these huge initial cohorts when the phonemes come in. And then finally this computer model, the trace model, um, which is a nice illustration of simulation of this. Do you have any questions to this whole chapter? Yes? Is there any experimental evidence for the third model? The for what? Sorry? For the computational model? Yes, yes as well. So they try a lot uh, to make predictions from the model and then they are tested on normal participants to say, okay, the model would predict that this happens, like the word superiority effect, that should happen, and then you can compare that. And that's an example where you also then find that the model, for instance, is over-predicting or over-emphasizing these top-down effects. So the word superiority effect, um, the really observed ones, uh, are smaller than the one which is predicted by the trace model, for instance, but they both predict it. In terms of multilingualism, yes, <laughs> that, that kind of it almost implies that there has to be uh, either you're perceiving all languages simultaneously <laughs> and could, could therefore pick up sentences of individual words from different languages and make sense of it, or it's implying there must be some pre filtering effectively to, to have, an, have an allowed set. Um, I would say I wouldn't call myself bilingual but it's very easy if you speak two languages to just mix the words within a single sentence and have no difficulty understanding that so it is probably one lexicon um, well you probably can inhibit and select only English words but you also can mix them rather easily and seeing my, my daughter, who's now two and a half years old, uh, just growing up here to become bilingual, she, at the current stage, just mixes German and English words in a single sentence. Whatever is easier for her. And it's just that. Uh, is there a categorical perception? How, did, uh, well, how do participants indicate what they think they heard? So, so how did they say with this? Would, and if they said it, how do we know it's not a problem with just then articulating either a dog or because that's what they practice rather than as they can't actually hear that it's different. Um, to be honest, I don't know. But um, I would think that in these experiments this is controlled for. So you could say, okay, did you hear a da or a ba or something else, for instance? And you could just ask people to say, was that very clear to you? And people would say, yeah, it was a ba, like the other bus as well. That's the point about categorical perception. People would not report, yeah, I think it was a ba, but it was really hard to identify as a ba. Now it's very clearly, it's a ba to you. And then very suddenly it switches to, let's say, a da. So it's, um, you could just ask them. Uh, but I don't know how exactly they did that in these studies. Okay, let's look at visual word recognition. And this illustrates that usually when we see something, we have read it already. So reading words is automatic. We cannot stop it. Okay, let's look at reading speed. And um, it's really incredible. So, Typical college students have an roughly average reading speed of 200 to 230 words. Um, if you are an excellent student, not necessarily in terms of your performance, but in terms of reading speed, you may be up to 600 words per minute. Um, however, then there are people who engage in training for speed reading, and there are a lot of courses on that available. And one of the um, of the strategies 
people may learn here is which is called skimming. So you basically screen the text only for important information but you lose a lot of other information. So when you assess reading speed one key thing you have to also do is measure comprehension because everybody can say well yeah I read that but they don't have any knowledge about that. So what you typically do is you have first you let them read a text take the time and then you ask them questions about the text. So you have the trade-off that typically the faster you are the less comprehension you have within yourself. And when you look at these speed reading training if you have top contestants you have one to two thousand words per minute with 50 percent comprehension and the world champion which when I made these slides a couple of years ago which was Ann Jones had 4,700 words per minute with 67% comprehension. Do you know the book, the last Harry Potter book, The Deathly Hallows? It's like that thick or something. It took her like 47 minutes to read through that. So, it's uh, fast and still retains comprehension on a certain level. I don't know whether it's still then reading is an enjoyable activity, but in principle. So I guess that like, <laughs> just flipping the pages takes longer, doesn't it? <laughs> versus what goes into long-term memory and is actually retained. Well, if you remember that short-term memory is really just like 20-30 seconds. Yeah, so it's got to be there. So, um, it is in a way long-term memory. Maybe not that consolidated that you could keep it for days and yeah. days. Yeah. It might, it might actually not yeah, I mean, obviously, that if you read at that speed, you can't grasp everything at the same. There, there is a trade-off. The faster you are, the less input. Okay, so I thought, as a little, little thing to do here, uh, we can do our own little. Can you please be quiet? Okay, we can do our own little test of reading speed. So. Uh, Let's go through that. That, of course, won't be that accurate. So, on the next slide, there will be a screen with text on it. And please read this text as fast as you can. And time yourself with that. However, make sure you comprehend it. Because afterwards, I will put up some questions on the content of the text. Okay, so please time yourself. So get your mobile phone, put it on stopwatch, and on the next slide, I will explain you exactly what to do. Just open the stopwatch right now, maybe. Okay. Okay, so when you have your mobile phone, and then there will be a little counter on the screen which counts down like four, five, three, two, one and then the text will appear. Press start. Can you please listen otherwise it doesn't work, okay? Press start. Read as fast as you can and if you've done press stop. Look down, write down and don't look at the text again because then you're effectively cheating. When you then more slowly read through the text and then you say oh I had a 100% comprehension. It doesn't work, okay? So just do it that way so don't look at the slide again and write down your time and then afterwards when everybody has read through that you will get some comprehension questions and write down how many you got right okay okay are you ready
Don't look at it after you have read it. Okay. It's gone now. Okay, you can look now again. I hope you've written down. Now, a quick comprehension test. Just write down on a sheet of paper or something, again, for question one, whether that was A, it's a multiple choice test, whether it was A, B, or C, and so forth. So just write down the answers. I will just put all of them on there and you can answer them in your own speed. had 80 words and so to calculate your words per minute score just let, if we say t is the time it took you in seconds okay not in minutes so in seconds uh, then do 80 divided by t multiplied with 60 you probably don't need the brackets for the formula to be correct so this will be your word per minute's reading speed <coughs> your comprehension score so these are the correct answers to the questions and your comprehension is you just have to see how many you have right there's a number of n just divided by 5 and multiply with 100 and you have to present uh, the percentage correct Speed accuracy trade off. <laughs> the faster you are, the lower your accuracy. So. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I think you are aware that this is, of course, a very, very crude measure only and gives you a very rough guideline and more an, an idea of how these tests work. A proper speed test would have been uh, a more controlled text and it would be much longer text and you would have much more questions for comprehension so um, and then the results become more robust and you can tell more from them okay so just again to put these numbers up whatever you calculated 
typically 200 230 words normal people up to 600 words if you really engage in these speed reading trainings up to nearly 5,000 words per minute which is really crazy which is like uh, 20 times the speed of a normal person I've heard that John F. Kennedy was really good at very fast reading as well okay so reading words is automatic that's what we have seen and now this automaticity actually helps letter identification and this is now we again um, come to the word superiority effect but this time not in the auditory domain but in the visual domain so this automaticity so let's say now in the visual domain you are presented uh, first with a blank screen then a letter appears which you need to identify however this letter is presented very briefly only and immediately followed by a mask which makes this task perceptually really difficult and then you get a forced choice was it a D or a G what you have seen now this is the letter only condition and then you have a word condition where the same letter can be part of the whole word and the word superiority effect again uh, indicates that people are better in this condition than in this condition because here we automatically can read although it's so briefly presented the whole word and the word activates its letters in this case in the visual domain you might say because it's such a brief presentation this is a much more crowded display so much more difficult to identify an individual letter but in the end it's easier when it's part of the word okay so when we want to investigate the process of reading one of the key uh, methodological approaches is to use eye tracking and there are a lot of different systems available this is one of uh, rather old system which just has you have this type of thing on your head where you have two cameras attached here which look at the eye in addition you have these LEDs on your screen so that the tracker knows how exactly you hold your head because you need to know that in relation obviously to know where exactly you look on the screen um, we have an eye tracker actually here at Brunel so uh, sometimes I think it can be used for final year dissertation students uh, for master thesis in any case um, and it is really weird uh, I used it only once myself and in the beginning you have to do a calibration which is not more than you just have to look at dots which are appearing however because as soon as the eye tracker realized okay you are looking there it says registered present the next dot so it kind of feels as if you are pushing buttons with your eyes and that is a very strange thing to, to have happened after a short getting used to it it's quite funny but in the beginning it was a little bit strange so this is a different system where the cameras are not to the attached here uh, on, on this frame on the head but actually are on the screen um, but they all have advantages and disadvantages and they try to identify the eyes and, and where the pupil is and where you're actually looking just to make that clear um, you may some of you may have smartphones which have like features where they detect if you look at the bottom of the screen it scrolls up automatically and stuff like that this type of eye tracking is much less accurate so you couldn't do like probably not proper reading studies with that um, they just look roughly where on the screen you're looking okay so you probably know that when we move our eyes then we don't do that in a smooth way but by saccades so if you're looking around your eyes are jumping around you can't easily move them in a smooth fashion and the same holds for reading so we jump from one point to the next just as a little aside do you know how to make your eyes move smoothly If you try it like this and say okay now I will look over this in the back and look smoothly it doesn't work you can't do that 
However, follow me. And suddenly your eyes can move smoothly without saccades or your finger. So if you follow a moving object, our eyes are in principle able to do that. But for the normal type of vision, stationary field, um, they don't. If they jump, when you do this as well, you should see your GP actually, I guess. So. <clears throat> okay, so we have these fixations between the saccades. So our eyes jump somewhere, then they fixate that, then they jump somewhere else and fixate again. The saccades are very fi fast, the fixations are longer. We are now in reading, in this context, they are typically between 200 to 250 milliseconds for good readers and they are slower if you're a slow or a poor reader or children who are not that uh, proficient in reading as well. The difficulty of the text also affects the duration of the fixations and therefore the speed of the reading. And one crucial point, and that is true not only for reading, for, but for our general information uptake, during the saccades we are basically blind. We are only taking up information during the fixations. So let's have a look at when you do these type of studies, how you do then the analysis. So people look at this word, then they jump here, have a fixation, jump here, have a fixation and so forth. Then you go to the next line, jump here, and then you have here something uh, which is called a regression. So your jump may have been too big, you didn't get the content, so you jump back and go forward in smaller, smaller jumps. So that's the way then where people investigate how long do we look at things, at what words are we looking, and things like that. And uh, I would like to show a small video clip. It's not the best quality, um, but it's a nice demonstration of how that then actually looks like in different examples of, of text. It doesn't have any sound actually. So these are just examples or prototypical examples. <laughs> See here that the people often jump to the wrong place. Okay, just as an example how uh, such traces of actual uh, movement, eye movements look like. Okay, we have that. Okay, one concept which is quite important in these type of investigations is which is called the perceptual span. And the perceptual span um, 
refers to reading and it's basically our effective field of view which we do read and if you uh, remember our foveal vision that means there where we have really the acuity is actually quite small so uh, if you simulate kind of the acuity by this blurring then it's only a few letters where we have high acuity and however we use quite a lot of information even with low acuity for instance to identify where word boundaries are so that we can determine the target of the next second so this perceptual span, so how many letters are we using, uh, is affected by a lot of different factors like the size of the print, the difficulty of the text, how good you are at reading and things like that. And usually because we read from left to right, um, it's only a few letters to the left, three to four letters, but up to 15 letters to the right. So it's quite asymmetrical. And if you're in other languages, like Hebrew, where you read from right to left, it's reversed. So then on the right side you have a short perceptual span, on the left side you have the longer, longer perceptual span. Presumably that means that reading speeds are impaired when you're not reading in your native language, in that case. Well, if you really switch between like a left to right and right to left language, that would impair you, yes unless you learn it from childhood and are, let's say, bilingual in reading as well, possibly, I don't know then. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, and these studies have revealed that we pay quite a bit of, that there are quite a lot of differences in how much attention we pay to different types of words. And attention meaning looking at them at all and for how long do we look at them. So for instance it has been shown that nearly all content words are fixated in a text. However function words like the or a are only rarely fixated at. They're just picked up and processed by our fixation span by just this blurry information we identify that. The frequency makes an impact so rare words are fixated longer than common ones, for instance. And we have certain predictability, effects of predictability, that when we have very predictable words, we fixate them for less time than when there comes a word which is totally unpredictable. Okay, I would like to finish that part off with a video clip which kind of summarizes all the different things and there's also one scientist, Keith Rayner, in there where we see a model then in the second part after the break which we will do after the video clip. <coughs> trying to sound out some of the words but she was just having some problems and so about halfway through the book she just closed the book and she slid the book across the table and said you know Miss Becky, I don't need to know how to read this book because I'm going to be a supermodel and when I'm a supermodel I'm going to read Reading is one of the most dazzling mental skills that people learn. We seldom think about just how much is involved. Our eyes move from left to right in a series of quick leaps, resting or fixating on the word for a sliver of a second before moving ahead. Okay, you can straight ahead, please. At the University of Massachusetts, a research lab is investigating what good readers do with their eyes. Dr. Keith Rayner is the director of the lab. I've spent my life using eye movements as a way to understand reading and seeing perception and visual search and other things because it seems to me that eye movements are a very good indicator of the mental processes that people engage in. Okay, could you look at the upper right hand corner of the screen, please? Dr. Rayner has found that skilled readers take in information from a surprisingly small area around the fixation point. Three or four letters to the left of fixation and about 15 letters to the right. Simply because of the physical wiring of the eye, you don't get much detail outside the point that you're looking at. You can try this experiment for yourself. 
yourself, hold up your hand just a little bit off the line of sight, you won't even be able to count your own fingers. That's how fuzzy it gets. So if you need fine detail, whether you're looking at a, you know, a P or a Q or, or uh, an H or a J, you've got, your eye has got to land right on the word. And indeed, studies of eye movements and reading have shown that good, even skilled, rapid readers pretty much land on every content word. Good readers seldom backtrack. They fixate on each word for a quarter second before leaping ahead eight or nine letters. Looks like they have things too. Good readers are highly systematic. Younger, less skilled readers spend more time on each word. They leap ahead shorter distances and they back up more often. They're going much slower because they're having much more difficulty encoding what the words are that they look at. Though they are slower, young readers follow the same pattern as adults. They don't hunt around the page for context clues, but instead decode one word at a time as their eyes move methodically across the text. Okay, yeah, let's have a break. See you in like five to ten minutes. Back. Okay, we have done more than half of the lecture now, so don't worry, but what will come now is a little bit complicated, so let's have a look at that. So the idea is now, how do we process the syntax of something which we hear or read? And so how can we use syntax to produce sentences? So we are basically able to, to produce an infinite number of sentences which are acceptable, which can be understood by another, another person. And we rarely or never produce unacceptable sentences in that sense. And Noam Chomsky argued we do that by using a set of generative rules, a phrase structure grammar he called that. And this is just one example, there are other ways of, or other systems of grammar out there which we speak about today. And this phrase structure grammar is often represented as an inverted tree. And we will see quite a few examples now to, to see that. So let's take the example of the sentence, the boy read a book. Then what we know is this is a sentence. And um, we know that a rule for a sentence is that a sentence consists of a known f noun phrase and a verb phrase. So we can kind of unpack the sentence and say we have a noun phrase and we have a verb phrase. Then we now know that a noun phrase consists of an article and a noun. The article is optional. So in this case we do have article and noun the boy. And as a further rule, we know that the verb phrase consists of a verb and may consist of another noun phrase. So in this example, we have our verb, read, and then we actually do have another noun phrase, article, a book, article, a noun. So in that way, uh, we can see how such uh, a system of rules can be used to describe the syntactic structure of a sentence. So, we do have knowledge about which words we can use for the different categories. It may seem very obvious, but that was something which we have learned. So when we have a noun phrase and a noun, then we only can use nouns, obviously. When we have this article in the noun phrase, we use words like the or a, or we can leave it empty. <clears throat> so, if we want to generate a sentence, the idea is then we start at S and then we unpack the S into NP and VP, the noun phrase and the verb phrase. Then this is unpacked and so forth, so that we can do that. What we use here is really a reduced and simplified grammar. 
for illustration to speak that through. Real grammar is more complicated for one reason, because you often have different alternatives how to interpret a sentence. We will see examples of that later. Okay, so some further examples of how this is actually used and that you can really quite can get quite complex trees here. So here the example sentence is the angry bear chased the frightened little squirrel. And you see the structure here. Another example these seven people include astronauts coming from France and Russia. So you see it can be quite can become quite complex if you want to get the syntactical structure here. Here we have another example where we have two conjoined sentences. The boy with the red shorts kicked the ball. First part and conjunction scored a goal. Just to give you an idea about uh, how that works. Okay. Now, the same thing actually happens when we hear or read a sentence. So, this is the question of parsing. How do we generate the tree? And obviously, we must somehow analyze the structure and then come up with a tree. But as I said, there are often ambiguities. So look at this, this sentence and see whether you can see both readings of that. You can read it in two ways. The first way would give rise to that tree. These students are boring, this reading. Then we have they, which is a noun, and then we have the verb phrase. Uh, students is a noun here, and then are, the students are, and then boring is a property of the students. So they are boring students. Or we can read it as students are being bored by them. So then this stays the noun, but here the structure is different and the verb phrase now is are boring. So we have the auxiliary are and then boring is the main verb and then students is the noun. <clears throat> so you can see the way we interpret the sentence gives rise to different trees, different syntactic structures here. Okay, and Fraser and Rayner, this is Keith Rayner, which we just saw in the video before, proposed a model how to explain this parsing, which is called the garden path model. And the reason it's called like that is that it can explain phenomena where people are led up the garden path, where you, most people would initially misread a sentence. Okay, so what they propose is the following. We gradually construct a tree, kind of bottom-up, while we hear or read the sentence. So we don't wait until we have heard everything. We start as soon as we get input. So, in the example, we had, it starts with the boy. And then we create partial trees, which fit what we have heard so far. And they propose that at a single point in time, we only construct one partial tree and not all possible ones. And this keeps our demands on working memory uh, rather low. Because like in chess, you often have like an infinite number of possibilities or a very large number of possibilities and we couldn't cope with that. Okay, now the problem is which tree do we construct when we actually have choices? When we construct, can construct two different trees? And then they argue the simplest syntactic structure is chosen. Well, that sounds good and well, but what is simple in this context? And they propose two rules and assumptions, and we'll speak about one of them today. The second one is described in the textbook or in last year's lecture. And we will speak about minimal attachment. Second one, which we won't speak about today, is late closure. Okay, so what is minimal attachment? And that is uh, that we prefer trees which have the smallest number of nodes. And we will see in a moment what we mean by nodes. So let's read that sentence and then let's go through how we do the syntactic parsing of that sentence. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, be honest and raise your hand. Who had difficulties understanding that sentence on the first time reading it? Okay, most of them. It is a syntactically correct English sentence. The way to read it is the horse, kind of, which was raced past the barn, fell. However, initially we often read something else. So let's see what our mental parser wants to do here. So we get, we read the word the. Then we know we are in a noun phrase. So when we are in a noun phrase, we know we need a noun. So we are kind of fishing for a noun here and we get it with the horse, which we read as the next word. Then we know we are in a sentence. And a sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So we need a verb. So our parser tries to find a verb, which comes here with raised. So we have our verb. Then we get this information past the barn. And this is something which is called a prepositional phrase. And that is something which is, um, or it is a phrase which works as an adjective or adverb. Here it answers the question, where did the horse race? So it specifies the verb. And then the word fell came. And now we have a problem. Because we have a perfect sentence, the horse raced past the barn. And now a further word comes and we don't know where to put it in our tree. And only now we realize that something went wrong. In our original reading, so far, we have five notes. One, two, three, four, five. Now what is the correct reading and the tree for the correct reading? After revising, when we see the fell, we may realize, ah, the horse fell. That is actually the verb for that noun, and not raised. So we have to rearrange our tree somehow. So that's our verb. So that's our verb phrase here. What we have here is called a reduced relative clause. Relative clause because it's a partial clause in the main clause and reduced because something like which was raised past the pound is missing. So we have another sentence in here actually with a verb and a prepositional phrase. And this sentence, logically, if you go more into the depth of that, is linked to the noun phrase. So that is the correct syntactic tree for this sentence. Now when we do now the counting, you will see that we have seven notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And minimal attachment predicts that we first or that we prefer that reading over that reading. Because that one is more complex and therefore we go back here to that. Okay, so the reason why we misread that sentence typically is only because we have a certain ambiguity here in the word raised. It can be a past tense verb, like the horse raced yesterday, but it also can be which is called a passive participle. That is a verb which functions as an adjective, a word which describes a noun, the raced horse. In this case, raced is not a verb, but an adjective it describes the horse. And because both forms are identical, we can be misled here. If there is no ambiguity, we don't have any difficulty. The car driven past the barn crashed. It's exactly the same sentence structure, the sec exactly the same past tree, but we don't have a difficulty here at all. The reason is that driven doesn't have a unique, is, is not ambiguous, it's unique. It's only past, passable, past participle because a past tense would be drove. So therefore we don't have any difficulty. Okay, 
So some further examples, I'll give you one or two minutes. Um, on the left hand side, it's the original sentence, so try to understand it. Here it's how most people would initially parse that, and this is how the meaning of the sentence actually is. Just some further examples of how we are led up the garden path. Okay. So, it's basically a very simple model, but it can explain quite a few phenomena. And um, some assumptions, after a bit more research, have turned out to be incorrect. For instance, one of the assumptions is that the parsing is done purely on syntactic information and that semantic information, context information, is only considered after the parsing has been finished. However, there are studies which show that we use semantics already during the parsing. Okay, so, to summarize that, the phrase structure grammar is a set of rules which we use to create sentences and to understand sentences. What we've spoken here about is a very simplified version. So it can explain sentence generation and the understanding. And we have these inverted trees to illustrate that. Um, however, remember there are many different ways of how to describe grammar and these theories and this is only one example. There are further types of grammars. Do you have any questions on that? Okay, then let's go to the last chapter for today, the last bit, which is text comprehension. And this is, so to say, the highest level. So when you read a whole text, wh how, what determines your comprehension? Uh, how good are you at it? So, um, usually these studies work in vision most likely because it's very easy from a methodological point of view as compared to auditory presentation. And it has been shown that there are many factors which affect how good we are at comprehending texts. For instance, our language skills and basic things like how good we are at phonology, how good are we at phoneme identification, how good are we at syntax, semantics, pragmatics. That all affects how good we are at um, text comprehension. More generally, our ability to quickly identify words and effortlessly. So how practiced are we basically? And the theory behind that is the more practiced we are, the less resources we need on these functions and the more resources we have available for the actual comprehension of things. And also prior knowledge about the subject so how well can we integrate the information we read into our concepts and existing knowledge? In general, the ability to make inferences. So if you do like logical tests or something with people, that is correlating with text comprehension in more general. Yeah, and finally, skills to monitor comprehension so that people can say, okay, why is a certain piece of information important or not? Do I need to read the entire text or something? So people who are good at answering these questions are also very good at text comprehension. And finally, and that's something where we have a little bit of a closer look, working memory. And if you remember, working memory is our ability to keep something in our short-term memory and at the same time do a processing task, which kind of is text required for text comprehension. Because we read, we get new information, we have to keep that information online for a short amount of time to integrate that into uh, the bigger context. And uh, Marcel Just and Patricia Carpenter looked into that and they proposed a capacity theory. 
and state that we the capacity in our working memory or working memory capacity is an inter-individual feature like the IQ or something like that. People are good at this or not good at this. So, and they predict that people who are good or have a high working memory capacity are also good at text comprehension. So I said that already, working memory is storage and processing of information. And the crucial point is that the capacity of the working memory is limited, as you remember. So the people who have a little bit more available of this limited capacity have an advantage here. And they designed, which is called the reading span task, which was one of the very first complex working memory span tasks. Now there are a lot of different variations out there. So what have you do, have, do you have to do in the reading span task? You must read, or you're instructed to read, sentences which are presented for comprehension. So later on, as we have seen before, you will get a comprehension test where it's tested where you took up the information. However, also, you have to memorize the last word in each sentence for later recall. And you have to do that in the order of presentation. So if you have something to write, we can have a quick example of that. So there will just be a few sentences. Try to read them for comprehension and at the same time memorize the last words and when it's finished write them down in the correct order and the way they were presented. Okay? Okay, so the correct answer was zoo, white, moon, funny, in that order. And I don't have comprehension questions here, but I think you get the idea of the tasks. They are very demanding because you have to have the short-term memory and at the same time you have to do something. And here it's reading span. Uh, it's reading something. Okay, so... Um, and they have found that the, this reading span task really correlates very highly with our ability to comprehend texts. So it seems to be that this working memory capacity is closely uh, linked to that and is important. Okay, And this research also has shown that people who have a high reading span, so score high in this task, they also make more use of semantic cues and when you challenge them that they can maintain two syntactic interpretations in parallel. That means that they are able to construct two of these trees which we ju has, have just seen, which people with a low span can't do, or at least not that easily. So that people with a high span, if they encounter difficulty, sen difficult sentences where you have ambiguity in the structure, that they have the advantage of more easily finding the correct structure and solution and may not have to go back in their reading like we have seen in these eye movement things to reread sentences for instance for an alternative parsing. Okay, so it really seems to be a very important factor in determining that. Do you have any questions on that? Yes? Sorry? What effects? Domain? Yeah. Between auditory and visual? Um, probably they are on a general level, but uh, so that you're better in one domain than in the other one. But uh, I don't think that these relative effects would be different. So when you, for instance, compare the dual task versus a single task situation or something. Okay, before everyone heads off, please remember next week is no lecture, okay? So we will be lonely here probably. Okay, thanks for coming.